The chapter in Herrick here is number 10, chapter 10, and um, Kenneth Burke's the first person to be mentioned here. Um, I just want to draw your attention to the second paragraph on this first page, page 239 in the sixth edition. Begins The second paragraph begins, Other contemporary rhetorical scholars, however, have focused on rhetoric um, as a means of understanding and living successfully in a world of symbols. So he had just managed just finished talking about Perelman and Habermas. We covered that last week, uh, the argument, sort of the idea of the new rhetoric as argument, right? Going back to Aristotle, that model. So in addition to that Aristotelian model that we see with Perelman and Toulmin and others and Habermas, um, obviously we're focused on Perelman. We also can see a revitalization of the other models. Um, not so much Plato. We've already done Richard Weaver, and that's pretty much it for Plato in the 20th century. But the other models kick in, um, and I, I argue that Burke is a combination of the, the sophistic and the Isocratean models. Um, and well, I think we'll see that here today is, um, sorry, dry mouth. We'll see that in a moment here with uh, literature's equipment for living. It's very much about aesthetics and style, right? That's very Gorgianic. But his kind of, I don't know, ethical commitments to community and to to thinking about everyday life, everyday citizenship in a very broad symbolic sense um, and knowing sort of how he talks about rhetoric in other contexts. I would also hold out some Isocratean stuff in here as well. We'll get to that. Um, but this business of living successfully in a world of symbols is an important part of um, Burke and Burke's work and his legacy. So talking not just about language here, not just like words themselves and sort of grammar and so on, but thinking about language as a broad social phenomenon, right? Language is something that we are immersed in, we're born into, we learn how to wield it, like learn how to use to tools. I've mentioned the connection between language and tools in the other Burke video. Um, but, you know, we, we learn how to kind of adopt and use and bend and create and, and all the rest of it, right? So, but language is one of the most important it sources of influence and mediation that we that we have right now obviously technology today is becoming um, so so important and is kind of combating language a little bit but we'll move into technology next week uh, or the week after um, so when we think about Burke here so the next section the next page we get into Burke and, and sort of his work uh, in terms of the subsections identification is crucial rhetoric is symbolic actions are important Rhetoric is symbolic inducement is important. Being human, we already covered that with the definition of man. Terministic screens is good. I'll get to that. The pentad is important, but we're not going to get too, too deep into that because it's, it's confounding, right? Um, so today I want to mostly look at um, sort of the aesthetic stuff and the symbolic stuff. But I will mention identification is his single most, um, probably a single most important conceptual contribution to rhetoric in the 20th century. What he did is in his uh, major book, Rhetoric of Motives, he was talking about rhetoric sort of historically, going back to the beginnings, and noting that if you go back, go back to all the ancients, you'll find that identification is actually sort of what they're talking about. They're talking about persuasion and sort of deliberate persuasion and so on. But he also notes that identification is this kind of larger, this larger process or attempt to kind of find common ground or commonalities with, with others, with audiences. And so identification becomes his kind of renewed or revised way of thinking about rhetoric, right? It's not just persuasion, it's identification. So he kind of replaces, he substitutes one concept. My goodness, I'm so dry throated. Sorry, dry throat here. Um, identification is the key term in Burke's theory of rhetoric, you bet. And this business of sort of thinking about common ground, right? Standing on common ground. Um, you meet someone for the first time, you try to find commonalities, right? Like, where'd you grow up? Well, you know, what's your favorite sports team or whatever? That's all I got identificational. And if you wanted to kind of go a little further, you could say that it's also enthymematic in the sense that we're, we're constantly trying to appeal to one another in terms of like stuff that's below the surface that we're trying to hook into, right? We do this naturally all the time, socially, just sort of as a way of figuring out kind of like who we're like and who we're not like. And so... Burke also notes that identification and division are kind of flip sides of the same coin. 
So if you're saying that I'm a hipster or I'm a jock or I'm a nerd or I'm a vegan or whatever, you're sort of implying that you're not these other things, right? And so identification is this kind of alignment, but it implies a disalignment, right? And, and in Burke's world, as we talked about with the, the definition, there's always this kind of duality, right? And so one thing implies the absence of another thing, right? That, that concept of the negative, the principle of the negatives is sort of always present here. So to say that I am a, you know, I'm an American, like if you, if you, um, I'm Canadian, as I think some of you know. It's like I came to this country, and and I'm a, um, I have a green card, but I'm not a citizen. And if I were to become a citizen, the United States would actually require me to renounce my Canadian citizenship, because every, as Burke would say, every A implies a not A, right? So to be an American means to be not a Canadian. Fortunately, the Canadian government doesn't recognize that. At least last time I looked, many years ago, I, I found that the Canadian government doesn't actually recognize that. So you can renounce the, their, your, your born citizenship and you can still keep it, right? So you can have dual. Um, in any case, this business of identification and division is, is really crucial in terms of thinking about life symbolically because we're always in this business of aligning ourselves symbolically with others. However, we might sort of go about that and whatever those symbols might be about, right? But if you think about not just language, but symbolism in general, you're in a very broad, broad range of, of stuff, which is, you know, um, not just words, not just language, but clothing, colors, shapes, right? Slogans, think about memes. These are all symbolic. And so it's really a crucial part of how we live everyday life. So identification is important. Um, deterministic screams is good. We'll get back to that in just a second here. So let's just go ahead and jump into the um, literature as equipment for living. The, in addition to the definition of man, this is another piece that I've had good success teaching just because it's short. It's not overly complicated. Um, he's making a simple but, again, powerful point here. He's starting off by talking about proverbs. And let, let's just meditate first on, on the title, let Literature as Equipment for Living, right? Now, Burke started out not as a rhetorical scholar, but as a, someone who was interested in art, in music. He wrote music criticism. He, um, he was really interested in just sort of the arts in general, poetry, literature, um, the written word, and so on. He came into rhetoric because he realized that when we're engaging in the production of poetry or stories or whatever, we're actually doing more than just creating these kind of pure fantasies, right? I don't know if you've taken too many literary classes, but, you know, there used to be this old idea that literature is about kind of permanence and beauty and transcendent ideas and values and so on. Um, and that it doesn't really have much to do with our everyday lives. But Burke had a very different attitude. A very different take and he said that um, you know there's there's always a kind of sociology or a social component a, a kind of pragmatic real-world aspect to literature to poetry to stories storytelling and so on and that you can think about that real-world aspect as rhetoric as, as rhetorical so for Burke art literature poetry music is rhetorical in the sense that it's creating, in this piece he talks about attitudes, He's, he calls them strategies at first, but then he says sort of broadens that and saying, you know, you can think about a strategy as an attitude, right? And so, you know, think about music and creates attitudes, films create attitudes, stories create certain attitudes, and um, those attitudes are offered to audiences to sort of take up. And then the attitude implies action. That's the sort of the key part here, right? So these texts that we might have, that we might read, engage, they um, they imply certain kinds of worldviews that that sort of go along with certain kinds of sort of policy preferences and and sort of imply certain behaviors and so on, right? This is what he means by like the sociological component of of literature or aspect of literature, and it is. He says equipment. He says it's equipment, right? And so that word equipment is like, what's equipment? It helps you do something. So it's rhetorical. It helps you do something, right? So he starts off talking just about Proverbs. It's right off the bat, Proverbs are designed for consolation or vengeance, for admonition or exhortation, for foretelling. 
what's a proverb like like um, early bird gets the worm um, bird in the hands worth two in the bush that kind of thing right just little nuggets of kind of folk wisdom that we we sort of throw around and we kind of know and his whole point is like we, we might think of proverbs as these like little bits of kind of universal wisdom um, in fact, he says that they name situations. They refer to certain kinds of recurrent human, well, he would say dramas probably, or aspects of drama, right? So we find ourselves in situations all the time. Think about like, you're in love with someone. My daughter fell in love with uh, this, this guy um, last fall, and he's from Hong Kong, Jason, lovely guy. And um, they were just getting really serious, and he had to go back to Hong Kong to, um, well, he'd been here for a couple of years. He wanted to go see his family and, and he needed to take a test and so on. So that, that situation, that recurrent situation of you're in love with someone and they're moving away, right? Burke would say that we have literature or proverbs kind of designed, to, they exist for situations like this, right? So, you know, you can imagine yourself saying to someone, don't worry, sweetie, absence makes the heart grow fonder, right? It's like, don't worry about it. You know, being apart from each other is just going to make you want to be together all the more. And that's some, that's like medicine. It's equipment, right? It helps you. It provides something, gives you something, it satisfies something, right? And it's rhetorical in that way. It's, it's equipmental. Equip, yeah, equip, equipmental. Equipmental. I'm trying to learn that word. Equipmental. Um, it's functional. It's pragmatic. It helps, right? Now, imagine that... Um, this is not happening. This is very <laughs> fictional. But like, imagine that, you know, her boyfriend found someone else or decided never to come back, right? Or maybe my daughter decides that she's like tired of waiting and it's too hard and, she, you know, whatever. Then new proverbs might kick in, right? Like, um, out of sight, out of mind becomes available, right? Don't forget Aristotle's definition of rhetoric, the available means of persuasion. What about the available means of offering proverbs. So what's available in this situation here? And the point that Burke's making is that proverbs have these kind of rhetorical functions, right? They offer us consolation, they get us angry, they just, they, they give us a sense of calm, they motivate us, right? They, um, they provide a little bit of kind of nourishment or sustenance in a given situation. So this is already kind of tipping off this business about rhetoric as situated, which we should already know, but we'll revisit this uh, in the next video. Um, so he says at the bottom of, actually I have a different copy here, but at the end of that next paragraph in the first section, he says, I submit that such naming of Proverbs name situations that such naming is done not for sheer glory of the thing, but because of its bearing upon human welfare. So proverbs assist with human welfare. They give us a sense of peace and calm and reassurance, or or they rile us up and you know get us going. Um, a different name for snow implies a different kind of hunt. Some names for snow imply the word imply is very prevalent here. So he's not saying that this stuff is necessarily directly saying you should do this or that or that. But these proverbs, these slogans, these little bits of aesthetic offering, words, sentiments, they give us a little sense of, of comfort, relief, assurance, fortification. And they imply certain kinds of behaviors, actions, maybe policies or whatever, right? So much is packed within these, these little slogans, these little proverbs. A different names, yeah, and some names for snow imply that one should not hunt at all. And similarly, the names for typical recurrent social situations are not developed out of disinterested curiosity, but because the names imply a command, what to expect, what to look for. I wrote in the column, it's enthymematic in this way, all this imply, 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 right? So, um, absence makes the heart grow fonder implies that you should hang on, you should like, you know, stick it out, you should um, be hopeful, you should, you should send the care packages and the letters and keep the phone calls going because, you know, it's just going to in intensify your desire to be together and that's going to help you. If something goes wrong and, you know, he decides, ah, the relationship's over, then new proverbs become necessary, right? And it's like, well, don't worry. Um, I don't know, I'm, you grab something to say, to be helpful, to like, you know, provide some kind of, of, of care, essentially. And what's interesting here is it's not 
the, the, the point about the sort of equipment for living, it's not about whether it's true, right? It's not like if it's in an ultimate sense, what you're saying is true or right or accurate or clear, you know, whatever. It's like, no, no, it's about the situation. And it's about what's sort of like appropriate and needed in that given situation. Now, he does say toward the end that you do want your your sort of understanding or your reading of a situation to be proper. You want it to be as accurate as possible. But but the main thing is to sort of like instrumentally help someone, an audience, right? Your daughter or your friend or a group of students or whatever by offering some bit of folk wisdom, right? And so that's the kind of the basic point of Proverbs is they're not some necessarily transcendent kind of wisdom from God that's true for all time or whatever. No, no, these are like available resources for, for sort of medicine almost, for situations. Um, so in the next section, the second section, he says, step two, why not extend such an analysis of Proverbs to encompass the whole field of literature? Aha, it's a big move here, right? So he's going from little slogans to now all of literature. When he says literature, he means not just like novels or short stories, but poetry and, you know, the whole bit, essays, nonfiction essays. He would probably include, you know, this is early years of film, right? But, but film qualifies like television stories, fiction stories on television. All of this stuff is relevant in, in, in how he's thinking about literature, right? That he's talking about basically the sociology of art and how that's all rhetorical. Not, not always, not equally, but it can be, right? So poems, think about like the poems that we recite at, at funerals or at, you know, weddings and, and just how useful these things become and how we kind of draw on them for, for some kind of guidance and to help shape our attitudes, which again, imply certain kinds of worldviews and which imply action, imply policy and so on. Um, and to be honest, that's kind of it for this essay. So he says toward the end, the last, um, the last paragraph, after he sort of talks about like sort of good taste, bad taste, which we don't worry about too much anymore. But back in the early 20th century, there was still this sense of like high art, low art, good art, bad art. We're a lot more sort of open and democratic today. Um, you know, everyone's talking about the Tiger King. It's like, is that high art? Is that just fun, engaging, weird, whatever? We're in a very different kind of world, right? So don't get too worried about the high art, good taste, bad taste stuff. The point is function. The point is pragmatic. The point is, is how it is that aesthetics, literature, poetry, music. Um, Fiona Apple just came out with a new album. I don't know if you guys know Fiona Apple too well, but she was pretty big back in like the late 90s and so on. And um, she disappeared for a while, and she just came out with a new album, and everyone's kind of going nuts over this album, it's calling it a masterpiece, and it's the perfect kind of music for our moment, our time. I listened to it over the weekend. I, I didn't quite get it, but I'll keep trying. But, you know, that's sort of part of the, the whole argument here. It's like, I didn't quite get it, because it's not really kind of giving me what I need or want, or it's not connecting, right? But for others, it could be really connecting, really helping. Um, so... It's a simple but important and powerful and pervasive notion, right? That like literature, poetry, music, stories, narratives, these are rhetorical right down to the bottom. They come from humans living in the world and they, they offer things to other humans living in the world, even if they're kind of masked in the language of, you know, eternal truths or, you know, fiction or whatever, but they're still like, they're always useful and they're offering things. Again, not everything equally. That's the whole kind of point of it is like art aesthetics has its kind of particular idiosyncratic nature. But the general point is that these are all available ways of humans kind of managing their, their lives together. And so it's equipment, equip, equipmental. Equipmental. Um, I mentioned terministic screens in the chapter there. Terministic screens are a really interesting concept of, of Burke's. Basically, the idea is that language, words, terms, create essentially kind of filters or, or glasses, right? So it's like how we talk about things shapes how we think about things and shapes our orientation toward things, right? What you call something, what you name something, shapes your orientation, your attitude toward that thing. I remember after 9-11 happened, there was all this concern about like, 
what's going to get, what are we going to call this act of, of, of invasion? Was it an invasion? Was it an accident? Was it, um, an experiment? <laughs> was it like, and, and when it became clear that this was a deliberate violent act against the United States, then the big question was now, is this a crime or is this a declaration of war? And I remember there was a lot of us at the time, us, I was one who thought, let's please call this a crime. Let's please call this an act of destruction. Because then we can take it to take these people to court and put them in jail or whatever. But like, no, no. The president and his and his buddies wanted to call this a war. And maybe everyone else wanted to call it a war. But when you call something a war, an act of war, right? This they declared war on us, then think about what that implies in terms of what comes next. And sure enough, man, you know whole big shakeup in terms of the federal uh, bureaucracy and the Department of Homeland Security was created and so many different kind of changes came out of that single word, that war, right? So what we name things become screens through which we see those things, right? And it sort of shapes and almost determines how we respond, right? You call someone a villain versus a victim. That becomes a screen now that you are operating through, right? So I think you could line up his ideas about proverbs as equipment, slogans as ways of naming situations, and then, and then think about screens as ways that once you've named something, it essentially kind of channels your, your behavior, your thoughts, your attitudes, right? And so it becomes a kind of terministic screen, excuse me, in that way. There's lots of term and terministic screens right now about care, support, right, forgiveness, and so on, because these are sort of the conditions that we're in. So you find lots of prover prover proverbial language um, out in the sort of social media landscape right now. A lot of people trying to offer condolences. Weirdly enough, I was on Facebook a little bit ago, and I came across a video <laughs> posted by Johnny Depp. Don't know how it popped up there. Um, and apparently it's his like first ever social media Instagram video. It's like eight minutes long and it's just Johnny Depp sitting in what looks like a cave. Um, and he's offering words of consolation and he's, you know, he's a artistic type. He's an artist. I mean, he's an actor, he's a musician. And so a lot of what he was saying was quite um, poetic and nice actually, but he's doing essentially what Burke is talking about here, which is like trying to offer some consolation, some little bit of comfort. And sure enough, it's all like the terministic screen of care and, um, and understanding and empathy. Empathy is a, is a major terministic screen that many operate from today. And that's a good thing, right? So empathy, you know, asking for empathy, asking for care channels our thinking and channels our behavior. And that's, and that's makes sense. And it's fine, right? It is also worth thinking about when you're channeling, and again, this is Burke, the sort of what's on outside of that. When you're channeling behavior by calling something care or calling a you know this person a villain versus a victim, you're channeling certain kinds of behaviors and assumptions, right? And then the question to be asked for critics, for students, is what's being left out of that screen, right? So bring these things together, right? So you've got proverbs, or then you've got literature in general that names situations. If you bring in the terministic screen concept, then, then you can see how naming sort of creates a certain screen that gives rise to attitudes, behaviors, actions, and so on. All makes perfect good sense. Where we might run into some problems is the way that that, that naming and terministic screen process channels and sort of um, filters, right? If, when you filter something, you're getting a, a pureness in what's coming through, but you're also getting rid of stuff, right? So the question I think for critics is, what's being left out? What are other concerns? If we're naming this this, then what other possibilities are we omitting or, or overlooking or ignoring or actively like refusing, right? When we call something a war versus a crime, right? What are we leaving out as possible in terms of what's possible to think or another way of interpreting situations, right? So we got to be on our guard here. This is not a perfect sort of like, hey, once we name a situation, we've got it, right? It's perfect. Um, because rhetoric is situational, because it's pragmatic, because it's useful in this situation, it's partial. And so we need to be thinking about ways of kind of like seeing around these screens and these names. But for the immediate purposes, the concept of sort of literature in the broad sense as 
as equipment, as rhetorical, as offering something to audiences that they then sort of take away and becomes useful in terms of attitudes, in terms of action, and what that implies, right? And how we can additionally think about that by bringing in this business of the deterministic screens. It's really powerful conceptual stuff in terms of like understanding how people operate and how they are, um, again, the stuff on symbolic action, right? How we operate and how we exist in worlds of you know, symbols and, and um, the importance of symbolism all over the place, right? And so you might just be sort of like, I don't know, attentive as you're kind of walking around and reading the news and like, what are the names and what are the terms that are being kind of featured? And like, if there's a discussion or debate over like, let's call it this, let's call it this, you know, what comes out of that? What's implied by that? Right. In terms of our attitudes and the expectations for behavior and, and lining up, um, organizations and laws and so on and so on, right? So there's a lot of stuff that comes out of this. Um, but in, when you think about like the definition of man, we got lots of good stuff there in terms of, you know, symbol using and symbol misusing, right? So when we use these these proverbs where you, you were being, you know, symbol using animals, right? But we can also misuse them in the sense that we can misname. We can sort of get it wrong or we get it right, but right, you know, like, was calling 9-11 an act of war right? It certainly like enabled us to do a lot of things after that in terms of like, we got to go get them, right? If versus if we'd called it an act of crime, then it would have been a much smaller kind of pursuit. Let's just go find the people and the, you know, who they were associated with and let's bring them into courts and let's have the whole thing. No, 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 no. The administration wasn't about that. They wanted to go do damage. And so call it a war and then what goes out of that. Now, a lot of people probably think that was the right name and that was the right action, but others thought, nope, wrong name, wrong action. You know, think about what's come after and so on. So, you know, again, with Burke, a, a very kind of tiny seeming insight that has a lot of, of significance and resonance for how we live. Um, so between the definition of man and equipment for living, literature's equipment for living, you can see how, you know, just how rhetorical our daily lives are. Think about greeting cards or birthday cards or like, you know, whatever kind of card we might use. It's a similar kind of idea, right? It's like all around us. Um, gift bags with slogans or digital versions of these things. We send each other little, da, 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 right? This, all of this stuff is like little tiny um, samplings of the kind of phenomenon that Burke is talking about, which is like offering sort of interpretations of situations that others pick up and do things with. And this is, this is deeply human, it's deeply social, it's deeply rhetorical, and it's every day, and it's all around us. Um, so... This is why Kenneth Burke is so important, is that he was starting to theorize rhetoric as part of the kind of the symbolic action of everyday life. Um, and so I don't think I've talked about this yet, but, you know, you, just to kind of wrap up, you can think about two major, well, you can talk about a lot, but I tend to think about two major kind of legacies of Kenneth Burke. This business of identification and how it opens up rhetoric beyond language to the sort of the symbolic realm in general is huge because it's it leads it led to and is still leading to what I call or some call the globalizing of rhetoric. Right after Burke, rhetoric is sort of everywhere. Right, it's in our grocery stores, it's on our television screens, it's in our newspapers, it's sort of all around us, and it's the drama of human sociality, um, and then it's created through these symbolic narratives and slogans and and forms and so on right and we're always sort of processing our way through this stuff we're creating it we're offering it to others and so on so it's this is part of rhetoric's kind of expansion in the 20th century perelman was interested in arguments burke is interested in sort of the aesthetics of everyday life and the rhetoric of that um, and then the second sort of legacy is um, in the his book the rhetoric of motives he talks about the unconscious and I think this is the first time that, that anyone really seriously, a rhetorical theorist seriously says the unconscious matters. Um, he, now, he talks, talks about it in the way that, like, we often persuade our, ourselves, like, we might not even be aware of it, but we often convince ourselves to go do things that we might not otherwise do, right? Maybe a dream speaks to us or whatever. But you can also think about the ways that the unconscious can be influenced from the outside, right? My work is in food. 
ecology stuff. And I'm always fascinated by just how powerful things like sugar and fat and packaging and so on can be in terms of our choices, in terms of like what we eat, how much we eat, where we eat, when we eat. A lot of this stuff's coming at us in ways that we're not aware. It's unconscious, right? But there's a lot of what I would call rhetoric that's coming at our bodies, at our unconscious, our desires, our yearnings, and it's speaking to us in really important ways. So after Burke, things really expand. And we will see this. We'll start talking about narratives. We'll start talking about kind of everyday situations. Um, and then we will start thinking more about power and how all this rhetorical stuff is actually like is a little bit more forceful and uneven than we might think, right? So that's what we're moving into next. Um, 32 minutes is plenty. So hopefully that, that helps a bit more with Burke. And, um, and uh, I'll be, like I said, putting, putting another video together on uh, narratives and situation, which Burke nicely tees up. So see you then.